Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, the 3rd of what May. Is 20... up as it will be next. It's uh, Wednesday, the 3rd of May, 2023, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. Your host today is myself, Brian Girish, and I'm delighted to be joined by Alex Thompson. Alex, back with us. Uh, we're just going to bring him on screen because uh, we're very pleased to say Alex has a guest with him today. Hello, Alex. Good afternoon, Brian. It's a delight to be back after my extended break doing language study and foreign parts. And I'm delighted to be joined today by a guest who's come over the border from Cologne. Sitting on my side here is Dr. Jobst Landgraver. Jobst, just say hello to the viewers. And uh, you're, of course, a multi-talented man, so you'll be talking about some of your specialist areas, AI, which we've interviewed you on, medical matters, uh, biochemistry, and uh, a host beside. Alex, thank you very much for that, and uh, we'll bring you in very shortly. Uh, we're also delighted to have uh, Debbie Evans, the UK column nursing correspondent with us. So good morning, Debbie. Good afternoon, Brian. And it's lovely to see Alex back and to welcome a guest as well. It's great to have you back, Alex. OK, thank you for that. Well, of course, it is afternoon, but it's always a busy start to the day for me. Well, we're going to kick straight off with a video. Um, the UK is at war. There's no pretense about this now. It's just that this is not discussed with the general public. Let's have a listen to this little clip. Well, as the new Minister of State for Defence Procurement at the Ministry of Defence, I thought I'd come to Abbey Wood um, to see DNS, which is about as close to the front line of procurement as you can get doing all these amazing things, procuring new equipment for our armed forces, maintaining the stuff that's already there. Uh, it's been really interesting and I look forward to working with them in the future. I was incredibly inspired to meet the staff because, I mean, particularly the ones involved in, involved in procuring for Ukraine, they've worked so hard to get stuff out there and it's made a real difference uh, in theatre, made a difference in what is, you know, a full-on war in Europe today. They should be very proud of what they're doing we've got to keep doing that and I'm here to work with them and make sure we can keep delivering for Ukraine but also for the British Armed Forces and what they do around the world. Alex, I'll bring you straight in on that because um, he's very proud that we're providing uh, support, ammunition, weapons, know-how into this war in Europe. He's, he's very happy about it and of course it's almost as though provision for the UK Armed Forces is seen now very much as a secondary issue. What are your thoughts? I concur with your thoughts, Brian. Uh, the Minister for Defence Procurement, who of course is a junior minister at the uh, Ministry of Defence, or the War Ministry would be a more honest historical name, that role was always about making sure the nation had enough in stock to defend itself, particularly given that we're an island. Uh, that's our main priority, the defence of the realm. Uh, yet, uh, Mr. Cartledge is only really talking about the expanding front line of Europe. Now, I don't want to throw Jobst in the deep end, but as we have a German with us, Jobst, I think the Bundeswehr is finding the very much the same kinds of things, isn't it? Its cupboard is bare because all the things you have seem to be going eastwards. Uh, well, the Bundeswehr is basically only able to act within NATO um, within the NATO, and it can't act on its own. And yes, uh, a lot of the stocks have been used up. Yes. So general concern about this. Um, let's take the audience today through a little bit of how uh, the war in Ukraine is put across. It. And uh, here in UK, there's only one way to go, and that's the BBC. So this was the BBC uh, front page. And uh, let's get this labelled because, of course, the key thing happening in uh, Ukraine is a major war, but uh, it's difficult to tell by this uh, this image. And also we've got the fact that uh, Bakhmut um, approaching the very, very end of months long siege, horrific killing around that city. Uh, Bakhmut no longer mentioned by the BBC. It doesn't exist. It is of no importance that uh, six, seven, eight hundred Ukrainians dying a day, plus the Russian losses as well. But the BBC doesn't want to cover that at all. Uh, where they do want to head is in uh, this particular story. So this uh, was big for the BBC today. Nord Stream report puts Russian Navy ships near the pipeline blast site. Uh, this was the little header, uh, if I can bring this on screen, the little header under the um, 
picture. Two Russian ships were seen in this satellite photo at the blast site three months before the explosion. Um, but really, we've got no evidence, no real credible evidence being put a, uh, over about the incident itself, um, but we're very quick to say that it is the Russians. And there's another point here that uh, what is the BBC presenting when it presents the evidence? It's presenting evidence which has been collated from public information. And you'll see the relevance of this a little bit later in my segment about Ukraine. Um, but if we bring in the Ukraine page for the BBC, this one comes up. And um, well, then it gets a little bit interesting because we've got Russia launches missile attacks on Ukraine and it's talking about the city of Pavlorad, which we'll mention again in a minute. And uh, we've also got uh, what is really quite extraordinary claims about Russian deaths in the top right hand corner. Now, if you follow these through, there's no real analysis on this. This is simply what the Ukrainians have repeated through to the Americans, and the story is always the same. There's no uh, admitted Ukrainian casualties. They don't get talked about, um, but vast casualties from the Russians when the reality on the ground is the exact opposite. So the BBC helping to mislead the public here in what's happening on the ground. And if we go back to our Ministry of Defence, uh, essentially what we've got is propaganda. Let's have a look at this one. So um, this is their intelligence update from the 2nd of May. Um, so it's focusing in on problems with uh, logistics. Um, so it's talking about uh, Mazintsev's sacking, um, problems with logistics, Russia struggling to maintain the, cam the campaign, and it's talking about problems with ammunition. So this is all uh, nothing to do with the suffering of Ukraine on the battlefield. This is all to do with propaganda to make it appear that the Russians are incompetent and they're losing. And uh, the reality is probably 180 degrees out because if we have a look at the time report here, uh, this was going back to March the 16th, but of course it says it very clearly why the West is getting nervous about ammunition shortages for Ukraine. And uh, comment here, the most important pressing issue for the Ukrainian army is to have a continuous flow of ammunition. This is EU foreign policy chief Joseph Burrell saying last month, if we fail on that, really the result of the war is in danger. Uh, Burrell said that the Russian forces fire about 50,000 rounds of artillery each day compared to about six or seven from Ukraine. And that gap should be closed. Uh, but of course, if we follow through, the whole story is about the inability of the US or NATO itself or the European countries or indeed the UK to actually produce the required amount of ammunition to support the Ukrainians. So the spin from the British government and the BBC is that the Russians are short of ammunition. The reality is uh, completely the other way, that it's the West that's having problems producing the ammunition. Alex, just bring you in very quickly here, but it's pretty blatant now, the level of propaganda in UK. Yes, and I've noticed that both British and American sources, uh, just going back to the start of that segment of yours with Nord Stream, are hastily concocting alternative versions in which the Russians were spotted on the scene, which were not touted at the time. And again, I'll bring in Jobst for a soundbite here, because as a representative of, of the German uh, thinking section of society, Jobst, have you seen your official organs trying to push upon you in the way that has been pushed in the English speaking world, this idea that we've suddenly belatedly found the evidence that the Russians did it? I haven't seen that myself. No, what we, what we are seeing is um, the, uh, the inability to admit um, that uh, the reports of Seymour Hirsch could be plausible. Uh, and it's just not talked about, but we don't get uh, what you've described at the beginning. OK, well, just to reinforce the this point, let's have a look at the Times of Israel. Uh, this was back in January, but it's a very significant article. U.S. quietly shipping ammo to Ukraine from massive stockpile in Israel. And this story is about ammunition, which has 
uh, there to be used for potential conflict in the Middle East uh, now being passed across. So Israeli officials told the Times that Jerusalem had not altered its position against giving Ukraine lethal weapons, but it was agreeing to the US using its own supplies. So that was pretty convenient. And then it it reinforces by saying Israel has resisted providing weapons to Ukraine since the start of the invasion. One of the major reasons is Israel's hesitance um, over matters connected with the Russians and Syria. But nevertheless, we see the reality of where the shortfall in ammunition is, and it does not appear to be on the Russian side. Uh, if we go back to the intelligence update, we've got more uh, basically propaganda here because it's the Ministry of Defence saying that they don't know what the Russians are up to at the moment. Um, they appear confused about the types of facilities that are being damaged by the Russian strikes, this paragraph down here. And uh, if we analyse that a little bit further, um, the Ministry of Defence is well aware of the new targets of the Russian military because they are specifically back on industrial and logistics infrastructure on the fronts. And uh, if we watch this uh, little video clip, um, really we're seeing that there can be no, no illusion over what the Russians are doing, but the Ministry of Defence here in the UK doesn't want the public to know. Let's look at this, uh, 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 this explosion and then I'll take you through what, what you're seeing. Ещё, ещё. Иди So for those of you who were able to see the video clip, a massive explosion. This was a very, very big Ukrainian um, ammunition dump exploding as a result of deliberate targeting by Russia of the areas where the uh, Ukrainian forces are marshalling in preparation for their supposed offensive. And remember that this is Ukrainian forces that are going to attack the prepared Russian positions without any air cover. Um, huge amount of ammunition destroyed there and really massive explosion. Uh, let's just move on to this next clip where we've got the US General uh, Cavioli, who is uh, reporting on the state of the Russian military. First of all, sir, if I could, I'd, I'd like to um, underline your comment about the specificity of the degradation of the Russian forces. Um, it, much of the Russian military has not been affected um, negatively by this conflict. Um, one of those forces is their undersea forces. Um, it's hard to talk in public, as you well know, sir, about, about undersea warfare and our efforts in that regard. But I can say that the Russians are more active than we've seen them in years, and their patrols into the Atlantic um, and, and throughout the Atlantic are, are, um, are, are at a high level. Uh, most of the time at a higher level than we've seen in years. And this is, as you pointed out, despite all of the efforts that they're undertaking inside Ukraine. So a uh, very interesting clip. And of course, what's the takeaway from that? That we have a major war in Europe. Um, everybody's happy now to admit that, including the UK government. The Russians are fighting that war on a scale not seen since the Second World War. And not only are they doing that, but the rest of their forces are operating perfectly normally, if not increasing their activities worldwide. So when we see the film clips, we can see the real truth coming out about what's happening. But let's take a little walk through uh, the Ukraine-Russia war and uh, think about key points to remember when we're analysing it. So I'll do these as quickly as possible. Remember, this is a proxy war. Ukraine provides the troops and the US, UK, NATO provide the intelligence, battlefield surveillance, targeting, command and control. And the assistance is of a scale and quality that Ukraine could not possibly achieve on its 
own. And this gives the Ukrainians a huge advantage over and above its own resources and military capability. Um, the US, UK, NATO, EU and others have provided weapons and ammunition, as we've seen. Um, but it's true to say that Ukraine would already be defeated if the, the West were not rearming and particularly what many have called a third created Ukrainian army, albeit with many uh, poorly trained, ultimately, troops. And this is the key bit that the US, UK, NATO and the EU are able to conduct what is essentially a body bag free war. So the West fighting this war for regime change against Russia uh, without the inconvenience of body bags coming back of their own troops. And if we follow through a bit more, uh, we've got to remember that this is backed by Western propaganda, although propaganda, of course, used by all sides. Um, but here in the West, we're faced with unprecedented propaganda about the war delivered through television, newspapers and online media. And that propaganda being delivered at national, local, household and personal level down to the individual. And the other thing that we need to remember is that the Western propaganda is clearly coordinated at a transnational level. So this is not just happening within the nation state. It's clear that there is a coordination of the propaganda line which moves across nation states and their boundaries. So let's uh, just add to that what uh, the intelligence system is that the uh, the US and NATO and the UK are providing for Ukraine. We've got human intelligence, spies defective, uh, picking up of loose talk, public broadcast monitoring, which of course the BBC is doing. Uh, we've got signals intelligence, interception and monitoring of diplomatic, military and other specialised sources. We've got the electronic warfare aircraft in particular, who are uh, intercepting, analysing, and not yet, but they could if it goes to a full war with NATO jamming of those communications, radars and sensors. We've got satellite information giving it the Ukrainians large area surveillance. And we've got drones giving generally smaller area surveillance. But of course, they can cover the electronic spectrum and photographic video means and as we're seeing in Ukraine, they can provide that weapon delivery. So the assistance that the West is giving is way beyond just the ammunition and the training of troops. They are effectively fighting the war at very high level alongside the Ukrainians. And uh, if we just look at it from another angle and consider social media, um, what have we got to do when we look at social media sources commenting on the war? Uh, what is the language? Is it reasonable? Is the site uh, essentially peaceful but factually reporting on the war? Is the, accurate, is the information accurate with the sources acknowledged, acknowledged and are they sharing? Are they working with other people? Are they cross-checking information, data, dates, locations? Are they acknowledging where that's not possible? And is there a very clear um, presentation of where information is coming from, documents, reports, maps, video, audio, geolocation. And remember, of course, that a key advantage of social media is often that the people are reporting, having spoken to friends, family, colleagues, um, people on the battlefield themselves. So don't underestimate the social media reports. And lastly, just want to say here that, of course, where you see social media banned by YouTube or attacked by the BBC, more or less, that is a medal of honour, uh, suggesting that the information coming out uh, is accurate and is concerned to, to the uh, powers in UK or the US. Why am I putting this on the screen? Uh, because we have had a little bit of a challenge to the fact the UK column is using social media uh, documentary reports on, and analysis. And I say to our audience that we are very um, measured in what we're putting forward. And we've also done our homework on the sites that we're using. So I am very happy to promote those social media sites in the forthcoming news. And we can share that information with confidence. And just to illustrate, I will just bring this 
uh, bring this map up on screen. Apologies for that. Um, uh, Weeb Union is one of the ones I've used. I'm just ending on this uh, because it, they are absolutely showing the end game in Bakhmud in a level of detail that's not being shown on the BBC. But there are, of course, many other channels uh, which are also putting out equivalent and very good information. So UK Column is going to say to the social media analysts on Ukraine, well done, keep at it, and thank you very much for sharing your information with us and others. Let's take a break of uh, subject and uh, bring in Debbie. And uh, Debbie, you're going to be talking to us about ARIA. Yes, well, um, my question really is to everyone uh, watching is, do you believe in coincidences? Um, and I'll leave you to answer that because last week on the news, I highlighted a little known government agency, a new government agency called ARIA, the Advanced Research Inventions Agency. Um, this, as you might remember, was the brainchild of Dominic Cummings. Let's just remind ourselves of last week's news. So when Rishi Sunak was Chancellor of the Exchequer, although he made, um, and people might not have noticed this, although he made uh, cuts to the research and development budget, he actually funded Dominic Cummings's mad scientists, in my opinion, idea for this new um this new government department called ARIA. Who's heard of ARIA? I hadn't heard of ARIA, but I have now, and it has been formally established. This has received royal assent, and it is now officially a government department. ARIA stands for the Advanced Research Agency, in uh, Advanced Research and Invention Agency. So this is all about inventions. Now, before ARIA was given royal assent, some people might have heard of ARPA, which was going to be our, the UK's version, if you like, of DARPA. That's what Dominic Cummings has been writing his blog about for many, many years. And he's been determined that the UK has its own DARPA. And this is actually what ARIA is. When you go and look at ARIA's website, and as I say, they are a government department, it really does get into the realms of science fiction. This is what they're looking to do. So I highlighted that last week and much to my surprise on Laura Kunzberg's Sunday programme, as I caught up with it later in the day, up popped uh, a gentleman called Matt Clifford, who is the chair of ARIA. Uh, and this this surprised me a lot because, as I say, nobody I knew had heard of ARIA and all of a sudden Matt Clifford pops up. Now, before we show a little clip of Matt Clifford, just let me tell you a little bit about him. He um, He's an entrepreneur. He co-founded Innovate UK. Now, Innovate UK, this is where the web gets a little bit tangled. Innovate UK is part of the UK research and innovation, which in turn is an executive non-departmental public body sponsored by the Department for Science and Innovation and Technology. So it all comes back to the government. He is also, you will be not surprised to know, uh, World Economic Forum Class of 2016 Alumni Global Shapers Community. And um, he is also chair of ARIA. So let's just take a quick listen to what he had to say on Laura Kunzberg's Sunday programme about AI. And you're very optimistic, obviously, about the future. But one thing also we've talked about here um, is artificial intelligence and both its huge opportunity, but also its big risks and a tech billionaire, um, Jan Talon, told us a couple of weeks ago that he genuinely believes that the path of very high-end AI might actually end up sort of destroying humanity. Now, you talk to the people who run these AI labs. Can you tell us when they speak to you, should we feel reassured or should we actually be frightened by the potential if this all goes wrong? Well, I think it's genuinely both. And I think, I think there's some, some good news there, so, uh, as, well, as well as some real risks. So, Absolutely, the people who run these labs are trying to build probably the most powerful technology in the history of our species. They're trying to build uh, technology that will effectively be able to automate 
you know, all cognitive labor and you know, be better than humans at everything humans do. And if that doesn't excite you a little bit and terrify you a little bit, then there's, there's probably something wrong with you. Now, the, the real <laughs> challenge is that um, we are advancing the capabilities of these systems faster than we're uh, advancing our ability to control them. Now, what does that require? Well, it requires investment on the control and the safety side. And mm -hmm. one of the other things I've been involved in is uh, the new AI task force that the government announced this week, which is really about the UK investing in its own capabilities in this space. And one is thing it I was adequate? Well, one thing I was really pleased about, um, and you know, I think that you know everyone should 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 see as an encouragement, is that right at the heart of that announcement was the idea of safe AI, the idea that the UK will be investing in safe, reliable, robust systems. And so, you know, I, I think there's a lot of talk at the moment about regulation. That's obviously an important part of the puzzle, but we must remember that that it's not actually on its own adequate. What we really need to do is invest in the technology to make mm -hmm. AI safe. So there you have it. Before I throw back to you for a comment there, Brian, I'd just like to say that the government, uh, the, the task force that he was referring to there that has just been announced, it's a hundred million pounds expert task force to help the UK build and um, adopt the next generation of safe AI on top of a 900 million pound computer tech grant. And it's all been modelled on, you won't be surprised to know, the COVID vaccine task force, and it'll be using ChatGTP and Google Bard. Well, I find it incre incredible, um, Debbie. Of course, he ended by saying, well, we're going to do something about safety, which leads me to believe it hasn't really been considered before, but now there's a bit of public for all uh, coming to the surface. They, they say, well, yeah, we've got to do something about that. And yes, we've had a taste of AI, haven't we, through the MHRA yellow card system, uh, where supposedly million plus was spent on an AI system to make the jab safe. Uh, but the opposite appears to be the case, that they can't even track the individuals who've been damaged by the jab. So I have no confidence in these systems at all. But let's bring in um, Alex, uh, because you've had some communication from the public about uh, uh, AI. So take us into, should we be worried or not? I will. I will read this email from a viewer, Monica, and then it's over to the world expert on the subject who's sitting beside me to comment on what Debbie has covered as well with us. So Monica writes, uh, thank you for my segment recently on one of Britain's local councils having its own nudge unit on the Wirral in Cheshire. Having listened to the Local Government Association podcast, I am shocked, she writes, but not surprised as to how deeply entrenched the practice of nudging or behavioural uh, modification has become in my local council. Uh, I won't read the whole text on the screen because people can freeze it, but she notes that the, a nest of charities, and a, I think a deliberate pun in the name Nesta, which seems to be a hub of many other uh, uh, third sector organisations, has taken over to some extent the government's behavioural insights team. You'll find details on both Nesta and government website of, the, of how that's happened. And Monica notes, just as a lay researcher, that Nesta gets its funding from a trust, which was in a £250 million lottery grant formed into a trust and they collaborate with Debbie's old favourite, the Wellcome Trust, and also the Cloudera Foundation and the Omidyar Network to dispense grants. Um, Monica gives more detail about Cloudera Foundation, which is Silicon Valley. Um, here she comes to a point with her research. I find machine learning and artificial intelligence rather worrying, as in wanting to take over our lives, which fits in very well with, and here's the third partner that she mentioned, the Omidyar's Net, Omidyar Network, Who We Are statements. They are a social change venture, not behavioral change, social change now, that wants to bring about structural changes that will fundamentally shift the systems that govern our daily lives, not us. Uh, she further links there from up to a decade ago, the time that Dominic Cummings was coming to Debbie's attention, 2014. All of this was being bigged up. Uh, but there we are. Dr. Jörg Landsgraber, of course, has written the book on this, which I interviewed him at, uh, on. You'll find that easily on the UK Column uh, website. Um, and so I'll hand over to him to talk about uh, what we've just heard about from the head of this new ARIA agency, uh, the notion that a government can decree there will be invention coming from the government rather than from private industry is interesting. And then his two points, we don't need AI, we need safe AI. And uh, AI is obviously terrifying, he says to Kuhnsberg, because it's it's now being designed to take over all human cognitive labor. Yost, your comments. Yes, so um, what 
this man said shows that he doesn't really know know what he's talking about because AI is applied mathematics with the ability to identify and also um, automate regular patterns in data. So only if you have very regular patterns, you can apply AI. Then you can, of course, apply, apply it very successfully and uh, the AI can become better uh, than a human being in certain specialized tasks, but it's, it doesn't have consciousness, it doesn't have a will, it doesn't have intelligence, it's just, you know, calculating. And what it calculates is totally determined by humans, even if the equations that are present in a modern AI are uh, only generated implicitly, it's all made by humans. So like any other mathematical tool, like a bomb or anything we can engineer, the safety of AI solely depends on the way it's used. So it's made, it's neutral, so to speak, uh, unless it's made for a bad purpose. And then it can be used for power abuse or for many other evil means, but it can also be beneficial, like all the other um, advances that have been generated by the Industrial Revolution. Unlike, for example, the COVID vaccines, which have no benefit at all and only do harm, this can be used in a harmful and um, also beneficial way. And the safety of, of AI solely depends on the way it's being used. Um, and the whole story that it's dangerous, that it can acquire its own consciousness, just shows that people who say this don't understand theory of mind, neither theory of philosophy of mind, nor not neurobiology, nor mathematics. And from a mathematical perspective, it's absolutely clear that there's no chance that the AI can be dangerous on itself. It has no subjectivity, right? It's always like a hammer, a bomb, or any tool. It can only be as dangerous as its user is. And you've noticed, Jobs, that since we left the EU, uh, we in Britain uh, are leading the Anglosphere and the Commonwealth into the brave new world more quickly than you in the continent. Now, you've, you've mentioned that to me a few times since you've uh, came to visit me. Is this true in this regard as well? Uh, is there uh, anything in Germany like a Bundesamt for official invention? I guess not. <laughs> so the idea that you can uh, create an agency for invention is, of course, um, in a way, socialist. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantasy. Invention is always done by individuals. And how inventive a society depends on how much education the individuals have and how much freedom they have to make their inventions. And then, of course, to realize the inventions, how the funding is. But all of this has only indirect to do with the state. The state can provide the infrastructure for this. It can provide the education system. But in the end, um, the whole uh, surrounding of creative individuals must be right. And certainly, um, in, a, in a restrictive environment or a restrictive environment, that the West is not now tending to. So we have more and more restricted environments in the West, less and less freedom, less and less, you know, the, the environment is less and less good for creativity. And so uh, founding an agency for, for invention will not change this. What needs to be done is to reinvig reinvigorate the freedom of our society. Which brings I, I, us on. If, if I may just, um, just come back in there. And of course, um, it's keeping the checks and balances on the people, the individuals themselves who are creating this technology, because if they've got a malicious intent, in fact, if they've got a mental health problem, um, we need to know exactly who they are and what they're up to. And uh, your uh, suggestion that we need to protect uh, freedoms in the country and freedoms of speech um, fit in with that, because it's only by having those freedoms that we can keep the checks and balances on the individuals creating the AI. Go ahead, Jobs, do you have a reply? Yes, um, that's exactly it. And um, in the end, you know, any society that, that gives individuals the freedom of expression and to to um, also obtain uh, funding for their inventions by competition can become creative. And, and I think um, we are seeing in the West a decline of the overall um, productivity increment. And that is to do with the restrictions becoming harder and harder. And the, the final part of AI in my segment here uh, is from a Substack blog. Uh, not all of Substack is hardcore dissident. It's, uh, it's quite a spectrum. Uh, uh, this blog itself is called Stories by Artificial Intelligence, so you can guess what they do, what their shtick is over at that Substack blog. Their head stories writer, Celeste Callio, has written an editorial entitled Why I Am No Longer Writing Stories with AI. Let's see what's going on. This uh, sort of cutesy typewriter font being used. I won't be publishing any more stories with Stories by AI. What was once a quirky lark or joke of a side-side project hits darker now. 
generative artificial intelligence advanced more quickly. You notice that there's so many adjectives with AI, safe, generative, regular, narrow. Generative AI advanced more quickly than those in the industry thought possible. Many of those who think about the harm such systems can unleash thought we would have more time to prepare. So there, Celeste Callio is admitting what Ilge Landgraber just said. People hadn't looked at the maths before they started championing it. Uh, then we read about chat GPT mentioned just a moment ago, and also in my interview with Dr. Jost Landgraber and uh, Barry Smith, his fellow author. And even they were surprised by its reception, adds Celeste Callio. Some inflection point or crisis moment was crossed between a wow and this is so good I should be using it daily. Business models that had sustained massive tech companies for decades were declared not long for the world, i.e. on the way out, and they flailed around to mount a response, a signal that they weren't yet to be counted out. AI will shape our lives in unimaginable ways over the next decade. Protein folding has been solved, famine prevention, generative capabilities. You've heard from Joost how that is overhyped sometimes. It's not the end of all human labor. But, says Calio, to what end are we harnessing the technology that some of our brightest minds claim is more revolutionary than fire? I think Joost would poo-poo that claim. Well, cheating on exams, spy spamming sci-fi literary magazines with AI-generated stories, uh, replacing low-level content creators, that's posh American talk for writers, trying to build skills and experience with cheaper machine-generated content. We've seen this in the press, haven't we, Brian? We're focusing the power of this new lens on amplifying the rewards cap flowing to capital holders because, of course, we are. So there's a cynical socialistic point here about capital exploiting labor. And so Celeste Callio declares, in a kind of flouncing out of this side project of hers, I want technology to be an aid to human creativity, not a necessary crutch. I want to make life better, a noble if naive striving perhaps, not to shove people aside because they're no longer feed, needed to feed the capitalist greed beast. Uh, maybe this was always the case, mass hysteria, etc. but I won't participate on this project any longer, though I don't begrudge others if they would like to. And her final paragraph is, I'll continue writing original fiction, hint, humans are needed, whether or not AI systems continue to progress to the point where human writers can no longer compete. I love creating new worlds, etc. So be kind is the send off. Take care of each other. Yogs, before I go on to a royal part of my segment, any response to that? Yeah, just very briefly. So first of all, many of the claims are just not true. So protein folding has not been solved. There's a progress there, but it's not solved. It's also not really a solvable problem. And as to the, the, the last point she's making, machines can't write original texts, right? The texts that are created by ChatGPT are highly repetitive and they contain a lot of errors and this will improve to a certain extent, but they will never be creating truly novel uh, structures. And, and this she doesn't get. So there'll be a brave new world, but there will not be a, a novel called Brave New World written by AI, shall yes. we put it that way? Well, let's so, move uh, on to... Alex, Alex if, I, if I may, a question then. Why do we have these very powerful people who are absolutely pushing this technology on us? You, you've set out the things that it can't do, and you're saying that it's not the great uh, solution that these people say. Why have we got individuals who are telling <laughs> every area of humanity that your future is all going to be AI? What do so they has, think? Sorry. Yeah, this has two reasons. The first reason is that they uh, want to, um, of course, um, make commercial gains by using AI. For example, internet search and other applications where they just want to make money by using it. And they create this fear so that they basically can obtain regulation that ensures their monopolies. You know, um, it is this idea that um, brought forward by Peter Thiel that competition is for losers. Basically, they want to prevent competition. So that's one reason why they instill this fear so that they can obtain regulation that protects their monopolies. Another reason is that the AI fear narrative is part of the larger fear narratives that we have on COVID and climate that are create a new, you know, uh, way of mass control. So I see these as the two main motives. So power and fear, the, the two yes, primal basically, instincts. Basically, really. yes. Yeah. So not very, not very digital, very, very human and, and, and uh, primeval, really. But here we are. We, we go on to uh, perhaps not entirely unrelated matters, but uh, on paper rather different. Uh, the realms outside the United Kingdom, which are... Uh, also uh, part of the uh, same crown as the United Kingdom, have been legislating some interesting changes. So thanks to our viewers for spotting these. 
first of all, the previous situation in the um, the last Queen's reign with respect to Canada, one of her realms, was as laid down in the Ottawa Parliament in 1985 in the Royal Style and Titles Act, that Elizabeth II was first and foremost the great, by the grace of God, Queen of the United Kingdom. And then because this is a Canadian statute, Canada was added secondly. Uh, and then of her other realms and territories. And it finished with the papal title, which the monarchy got just before the Reformation, Defender of the Faith. What's the current situation? The public broadcaster CBC uh, notes that because a Canadian budget bill had to come through uh, under the new King Charles, um, the style was changed. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, it was the Parliament assenting, so that you have parliamentary assent instead of royal assent, rather interestingly, the Parliament assenting to this, this claim. So it's suggesting in the Canadian wording that this was a request by the palace, possibly, possibly, we don't know for sure. But look, here's the thing. Charles III, by the grace of God, King of Canada, UK no longer first, not that I'm being chauvinist about it, but an interesting move, and his other realms and territories, head of the Commonwealth, no defender of the faith. Canada at least has scrapped it by statute, uh, as well as suggesting that the king, it's a subtle point, but it's suggesting here that the king is no longer king of uh, all his territories in different rights. So he would be his majesty the king in right of Canada, in right of the United Kingdom, in right of Australia. No, he's king of Canada. Uh, there are some Australian constitutionalists who claim that by the same dint, uh, there's been a, a newly invented corporation called the Government of Australia that replaced its, uh, its lawful predecessor. And going to Australia, thank you to a viewer at the top end of Queensland for looking at the, noticing this, uh, not far from him in the Northern Territory, Act Number 10 of this year in just that, that uh, Australian Territory, uh, is amending uh, the legislation uh, as a consequence of the succession of the Crown and for related purposes. Let's move on to this um, uh, video, which I think I may have to uh, start running uh, by another click. There we go. And you will see as we scroll down this that the schedule re revises a number of acts passed by this sub-national Australian legislature during the long reign of Her Majesty Elizabeth II. And Her Majesty is being replaced not by Charles, as if he were not long for this world, perish the thought, or not long on the throne, but Sovereign's name. That's the new rubric. Uh, it will not be um, replaced with Charles, but replaced with Sovereign. And look at the pronouns. No longer his, but all the refer references to our Sovereign Lady and her have been replaced by their. We'll serve them, not serve him. So we've got gender neutral language coming in uh, to the, the coronation. Uh, Brian, any thoughts on that before we go on? Well, I'm, go I'm going to say if this is correct, and I'm sure it is, I I'm not surprised in the slightest. And I think it just, for me, shows the duplicity of King Charles because he's absolutely a backer for all of this. He's in bed with the World Economic Forum. He's in bed with climate change. He is not interested in in normal laws, traditions, customs of this country. He is moving into the new globalist realm and he's going to be king of that realm. It, it could, of course, be that Parliament in Canada assenting means that it was Trudeau and the executive in Canada that was pushing for Charles no longer to be defender of the faith. But we know Charles's history on the matter back in the 1980s, although he revised his view in subsequent interviews. He was already saying he wished to be defender of faith with no article, which is not just an abstract point because it would disqualify him from office under the 1688 settlement. But we don't have time for a whole lecture now. So at the end of this segment, we'll just move into viewers uh, comments on the matter. Uh, a couple, Lisetta and Trevor Bray, wrote a couple of uh, very important emails to me. One was asking this, um, we are unsure, this is the second paragraph on screen, the rest you can read by freezing, we are unsure what is meant by the phrase in the coronation oath, and we've seen of course now with the, the rubric being presented a couple of days ago that we, this will be sworn again on Saturday, I will to the utmost of my power maintain the laws of God. Uh, the Brays have uh, sharp, been sharp-eyed and noticed that there's no, nothing about our inalienable rights as people or our sovereignty as people. But the question is, does the swearing to maintain the laws of God, which Jobst will attest was medieval German kings were doing this, everyone around Europe was doing this, does this relate to the Ten Commandments or does it, or is protection of inalienable rights of the people implied by this statement? And a follow-up from the same uh, people is... Um, uh, again, I won't read it all, but is there unlimited parliamentary sovereignty? 
And uh, you'll see if you read the whole thing by freezing the screen that uh, the Brays are concerned as, as people in their 60s, that younger people have swallowed hook, line and sinker the idea that Parliament is sovereign. Well, again, with the Germans sitting next to me, uh, I would have to say that the, that the Continentals have never accepted this. They understand that parliaments are under law. Well, what's going on here? Um, I would say that the, the, the key thing is that it's only in modern times, late modern times, that we would have this debate over whether inalienable rights are separate from the laws of God. The thought did not enter early modern minds. The laws of God included that a king was obviously meant to prosper his subjects and not abuse them. Um, and certainly where you're from, Saxony originally, isn't it? The Saxon kings had that laid down in codified statutes very early on, didn't they, Yobbs, that they were there to protect the people. Uh, a foreign perspective would be interesting here. Is there any need in our new coronation or any new reign with the coronation coming up for the king separately to swear that the people's rights are inalienable? Or is that encompassed in accepting that he reigns under God? So my view is that it is uh, included because natural law is derived from divine law. And so the classical view, at least before the end of the 18th century, natural law was always came directly from God. And so therefore there is really traditionally no necessity. If you accept divine law, then you accept natural law. And with regard to representation and sovereign, the sovereign is the people in Germany or in, in continental Europe in general, and the parliament is only a representative acting on behalf of the sovereign in the theory. Well, uh, you will have seen from what I've covered already that I am sceptical about Charles's ability to fulfil his role. So a couple of images from me uh, guiding people as to why I, or inter interesting them as to why I'm not going to be swearing allegiance out loud uh, on Saturday. The first is that Charles is named after the Stuart monarchs and mm -hmm. after the two Charleses we had James, responsible for the killing times, James the Seventh of Scotland and Second of England. And under him, there were hundreds of, uh, of martyrs uh, simply shot for assembling peaceably. The youngest or the, the last killed before James fled the realm was 16-year-old George Wood, who was shot uh, as this plaque in southern Scotland commemorates, uh, simply for having a Bible on his person. Uh, and uh, Philip and Elizabeth, for all the good they did, deliberately named their son after that, uh, that, rel that, that lineage of the Stuarts, which I think even in the 1950s made some of the most conservative and constitutionally minded people in Britain take note and wonder what was going on. I'd also remind people, if they don't know about it, that the last but one martyr of that killing times in 1688 uh, was James Rennick, uh, who was a Scottish preacher who actually studied over here in the Netherlands before going back knowing he was facing likely death. He was apprehended and executed. And uh, with the coronation coming up, I think this is a good thought for people who uh, sometimes worry that uh, perhaps because they're religious or conservative, they need to swear allegiance to, to, to Charles. Well, what's the biblical view as espoused by James Rennick just before he was martyred? He said, I am within a little while to appear before him who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords and who shall pour shame, contempt and confusion upon all the kings of the earth who have not ruled for him. Uh, and I have espoused that in my own life, really. In 2001, uh, I was being vetted by a GCHQ security officer, and he said, what are your red lines? And I said, I will not serve under a King Charles because he's disqualified himself from office by adultery. Uh, the picture there is of the closing ceremony of GCHQ Oakley, where I used to work. And uh, if you don't like it from me, take it from the older generation. My uh, uh, namesake and father, Alex Thompson Sr., uh, asked uh, the other day by me for a comment to the viewers as to whether they should watch the coronation and cheer and swear allegiance or not, because he's been concerned about this all his life, this moment. He asked the viewers, how can you enjoy watching when you know you're being hoodwinked? I think that says it all. Very much for that very interesting section. Lots of questions to be asked about the coronation. I share your feelings over King Charles, absolutely. Um, before we leave the segment, um, Debbie, you've got a vi video here, um, which is of Michael Gove speaking. Um, surprisingly, this video, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> This video has stayed up on YouTube. Yes, um, one person that has already sworn allegiance to the king, and for the record, I won't be, uh, but one person that already has is our uh, own levelling up minister, Michael Gove. Um, and I was very surprised. He probably won't thank me for reminding people of a little sketch he did uh, on behalf of the BBC in the 90s, prior to him being a politician, um, a programme called Stab in the Dark. Um, have a little look at this. It was Adolf Hitler. 
like Charles, a fan of classical architecture. Like Charles, a hater of metropolitan life and a lover of the countryside. And like Charles, a keen supporter of population control. Charles through contraception, Adolf through extermination. <laughs> and of course, they're both German. There is, there is one difference, however. When Adolf's wife tried to commit suicide, she succeeded. <laughs>
who's um, a health policy analyst. Now, Roy and I don't agree on a lot of things, but what I do appreciate with Roy is his willingness to talk, discuss and debate with everybody, including me. So yesterday I caught up with him to ask him about the consequences of this news because it's not quite what it seems to be. So have a look at uh, what Roy has to say about the current situation. There's been some breaking news today, Roy, in the fact that we've had the NHS Staff Council accept the government's pay offer for nurses. Now, ever since this news came out, um, I think a lot of people have been jumping to the wrong conclusion, thinking that this is fantastic. This is the end of the industrial action that we've seen with nurses who originally wanted 19%. But actually, that's not the story, is it? Because from where I'm sat at the moment, as the news has just been announced, the unions aren't happy at all. What are your views, Roy? Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. Look, it's good news. I mean, about 500,000 people have had their uh, appointments cancelled and they've been shoved back on the waiting list during the course of the, the strike. So, I mean, in a sense, it's good news. But is it over? I don't think it is. Um, the RCN, of course, walked away from the council today and, and wouldn't agree that uh, to end hostilities with uh, her, His Majesty's government. And uh, tonight they have an emergency council meeting where um, Pat Cullen will receive, receive, Pat Cullen, of course, is their general secretary, should be receiving new instructions as to whether or not they ballot the nurses for more strike action. They have to re-ballot because you can only, you only get six months in with the current industrial relations legislation and their six months has run out you remember them there was an argy bargy over what six months meant last week and they went to court and i'm afraid the rcn caught a cold over that and they've ended up having to pay the department of health costs but here we are so they're going to ban it again now here's the thing um uh, steve barkley has made it clear today that he wants to get the the money which is the five percent increase and the lump sums which start off at around uh, 1600 quid and go up from there uh, he wants to get that in the nurses' wage packets in their bank accounts in June. So the question then is, well, what would what will be the attitude of the nurses? I mean, some of the nurses will say, look, you know, I've got the money. It's, I, I can't see us getting any more money, and we'll call it a day. And the other lot will say, well, you know what? Uh, we're going to fight on here because 5% isn't enough, and there's a lot more stuff we want and, and all the rest of it. So it kind of hangs in the balance. If you were asking me, you know, am I a mystic Meg and to tell you what's likely to happen, I was at a very big hospital last week talking to the nurses there. My instinct is I think it's over. I think the RCN members will probably choose not to continue. And i tell you why. The, the RCN um, has a lot of members, uh, you know, 500,000 members, 300,000 members in the public sector. And... They they join the RCN for reasons other than a trade union. Most of them join uh, because they've got a, a professional indemnity insurance, which is really on very good terms. It's a good deal. They The young nurses like it because of the preceptorship help they get. There's a huge amount of studying and, and learning. Uh, the RCN have got the best library in Europe on nursing, just as an aside. Um, and so a lot of them join it for the educational aspects, not for a trade union. And I think um, whereas the turnout was actually pretty low to 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 re to refuse the five percent pay deal, I'd rather think this time if it's a big turnout that I think they'll probably say we won't carry on striking. However, there is another bit to this, <laughs> a more sinister bit. If the nurses decide that they are going to strike, that will give them another six months window. And there will just be an overlap by the time they finish balloting, because that takes a month and it's a whole palaver to do. It has to be done by post. It can't be done digitally. So by the time they've got out of the way and they let's say the nurses say, yeah, we're going to carry on striking, that gives them a brief window where they overlap with the junior doctor's dispute, the junior doctor's six months before the junior doctors have to reballot. So we could be facing... Maybe August or September, we could be facing the junior doctors and the RCN out at the same time. If that happened, well, that's gold command territory. We'd have to close hospitals and just have regional um, ITUs, regional uh, A&Es. I mean, that would be very difficult to manage. So that's a possibility. However, on the other side of things, the 
The good news is that this afternoon, the junior doctors are meeting with uh, Steve Barkley, and perhaps, you know, that might just be the start of some good news. Maybe they'll find some uh, some agreement there. So it, I'm, I'm sorry I can't give you a more uh, an answer with greater clarity, but that's kind of where we're at. I have heard just recently breaking that some unions, because um, we're not just talking obviously about the Royal College of Nursing, there's Unite as well. Some unions are talking about actually escalating strikes. They're that angry. And I've just seen a nurse interviewed, a member of the Royal College of Nurses, who's who's very angry and says that she's not going to put up with what Steve Barclay said or what the NHS Staff Council have accepted, and that she would actually ballot for more strikes. Do you think yeah. that the Royal College of Nurses, because as a nurse, I, I used to be a member of the RCN when I was when I was practicing. And of course, the nurses haven't been on strike for 106 years, I think it is. Do you think the RCN got a little bit complacent and took it for granted that if they did call the strike action, they would get far more public support than they've got and that the government would basically roll over and give them what they wanted? Well, you know, I do. I mean, I think that the RCM were taken by surprise that Steve Barclay just wanted to face them down. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think it was a mistake for Pat Cullen, the general secretary of the RCN, to ask for 19%. Now, she says she didn't and that was, she was misunderstood. But fundamentally, at the time, we all knew the nurses wanted 19%, which was 5% above the retail price index. 9%, 19%. She backed off of that and then said, well, I'll talk to me about 10%. And then she, I mean, she's almost like she's negotiating with herself in public. And eventually, you know, she said, well, make me an offer. And they went around the table and she's got 5%. So, I mean, there is that aspect to it. It wasn't clear really what the nurses wanted. As far as what happens next, and the nurse that you, you've heard speaking on the telly, I think, um, I mean, they want to up the ante here. Well, then the RCN are going to do that. If, if they ballot, if they ballot this time and they ballot again, they're going to ballot on the basis of an aggregated vote. Now, I need to explain this. The, 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 the union strike against the employer. The employer in this case are the NHS trusts. They all hold the individual uh, contracts of employment for the nurses in their trusts wherever they are. So 200 trusts, 200 places. They, they have to then vote to go on strike in that trust. That was called a disaggregated vote. So one trust might choose to go on strike and another trust may not. This time around, they're, they're balloting on an aggregated vote. So that means if a trust voted not to go on strike, but the majority did, their staff would still come out. So this is a, a, a much more difficult strike for the NHS to manage. I mean, until now, we've had sort of strike light, really. We've only had half the hospitals on strike at any one time, and the derogations have made, I mean, it made it difficult, but a lot easier than it might have done. So I think, you know, if they do ballot again, they'll ballot to up the ante. And the question then is, well, how much support will it get? But I do think the RCN have probably muddled it up really right from the outset. Yeah, I certainly feel as though the RCN, in my opinion, as a nurse, as a retired nurse, are letting their members down. And I know that you you are in a big demand today, obviously, because of the news breaking today, Tuesday um, on this. I wonder how much damage it's going to have on recruiting into the because I mean, bef before the pandemic, I think there were over 40,000 vacancies for nurses. So how is this going to appeal to, to recruiting and actually retaining nurses in an NHS that appears to be completely on its knees? Well, you're right. I mean, it's, it's made it more difficult. And in fact, for the first time last year, uh, applications to become nurses fell by 20%. Now, I've never seen that before. Nursing is a very popular profession for uh, young men and women with, with qualifications. So, it, and of course, you know, do they want to join a, a profession that's beset with industrial relationship problems? You know, I don't think they do either. And of course it is. I mean, the nurses keep saying it, and, and I understand why they say it, because it's they say because it it's true, but it's a rotten job at the moment because there aren't enough nurses. Everybody's rushed to hell. They can't nurse safely like they want to do it. And so it's the kind of job that, you know, is getting more and more difficult. The question is, well, what do we do about it? Well, it's more nurses, more recruitment. Now, the NHS has a workforce plan. The, the workforce plan has been ready since November. It's parked in the Treasury because the, tre the Treasury haven't wanted 
uh, to release it because of the financial implications of it. And of course, during the strike, it would have been difficult as well. So, I mean, I think the the, the there is a big recruitment issue. There's a big retention issue as well. And if you look at how long this is all going to get fixed, I mean, you know yourself, it takes three years to train a nurse plus a year's preceptorship on top of that. It takes 10 years to train a doctor. We need God knows how many more nurses. I mean, we won't know until we've looked at the workforce plan. The other thing is that the nursing is an aging profession now. I think it's about a third of nurses are um, over 40 and they can retire at, at 55. I think the, fig- the figures are around somewhere around that. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of retirements as well. And some people just, you know, so perhaps they might have done an extra five or 10 years. They're saying, I'm not going to do it. So whatever the fix for this is, I mean, the wages thing, I think, is done and buried now. I can't see Barclay coming up with more money. As far as the rest of it is concerned, in the package, there were changes to the agenda for change arrangements for nurses to give them a discrete agenda for change just for nurses. I don't know whether that's still on the table. There was There were changes to the pay review bodies where they were going to smarten them up. I mean, they do need to report quicker and look a bit more transparent. So I think they were going to do that. And also there was an undertaking to safe staffing, which the nurses wanted. But you can you only get safe staffing if you've got enough nurses. And as I've just explained, you know, enough nurses is probably 10 years away. So, I mean, this is, on the one hand, it's good. It may be good news. It be good, may be good news for patients and the cancellations will end. Maybe it will give some nurses some peace of mind. It's going to hack off a whole lot of other nurses who wanted 19%. They've ended up with, you know, 1% of nothing, really, as far as they're concerned. Um, and it's, I think, you know, the way it looks to me, it looks, um, you know, one nil to Steve Barkley, I think. So there you have it. Um, I'll leave it with our viewers and audience to make of that what you will. Um, But I've got a good news segment coming up um, and I hope this boosts absolutely everybody. Um, And we're going to be talking about the MHRA, but this time it's not doom and gloom for us this week. It's doom and gloom for the MHRA. So let's just take a snapshot of what's been happening in the MHRA's last one one week we're talking about. Um, let's see what they've had to put up with. Um, and let's look at some of our UK column experts and friends. Let's start off with Dr. Christian Buckland. And Dr. Buckland has um, put out an amazing open letter on behalf um, um, on behalf of himself. He's he's also chair of his own body. And I'm absolutely delighted that the Daily Skeptic have put this out because it's a phenomenal letter. There are some, just some screenshots um, also of his letter. Um, And I would urge everyone to go and look at it, to read it and to share it as much as you possibly can, because it really is phenomenal. So I would like to say huge bravo to Dr. Christian Buckland. Um, We're absolutely delighted that he's making the MHRA's life very difficult and the government's life very difficult. And I hope Rishi Sunak enjoys reading his letter. And then we've got the Perseus group who've also been uh, making the MHRA's life very difficult. The Perseus group, for those that don't know, are a multidisciplinary group um, of experts from all sorts of different fields, pharmaceutical, manufacturing, medicine. And they wrote um, a report, Safe and Effective. And this this Safe and Effective report, um, it was delivered. Sorry, oh, that's the letter from Dr. Christian Buckland. Sorry, did you want to flash back to that? There we go. That's the letter from Dr. Christian Buckland, if you want to take a screenshot of it. Um, Have we got the slide for Perseus by any chance? There we go. That's Perseus Group. Um, Please go and look at the website. And as you can see, they've done a report there, safe and effective. And an open letter was delivered, hand delivered, I'm delighted to say, by our wonderful friends and experts on UK Column. There's a picture of Hedley Reese there. Um, And you can see Dr. Ros Jones, Hedley Reese from PharmaFlow, who's a world expert in manufacturing and distribution. So the MHRA are going to get that on their desk, as is Rishi Sunak. So bravo, bravo for that. 
And then, of course, we've got Professor Norman Fenton, who has been doing a sterling job on YouTube um, and has been analysing the Nicola Wheatley lecture that we alerted him to. And then he also put out on his YouTube um, the the piece that we did with him in last week's news. So the MHRA are under fire from him as well. So bravo, bravo. And then we can go on again with another another one of our uh, amazing guests, and that's Peter Todd. And Peter Todd, as you know, is our, well, by his own admission, is a maverick solicitor, consultant solicitor, who works for many of the vaccine injured and also the vaccine bereaved and was named as the lawyer of the week by none other than the Times um, for acting on behalf of the family of a 32-year-old doctor who died after a COVID vaccine. So bravo, bravo to Peter Todd. I'm so sorry for the circumstances. And yet another one of our great friends and experts, Cheryl Granger, who of course uh, came face to face with Dame June Rain on the MHRA board meeting. She's done two amazing exclusive articles for UK Column, taking on the MHRA part one and taking on the MHRA part two. Please share these articles wherever you can, because I'm so delighted. You know, this is a this is a massive, a massive achievement by everybody that's watching, that's clicking into the MHRA board meetings, that's forwarding our material, that's supporting these amazing experts who are putting their careers on their on the line many, many times. And, you know, let's go back to Stephen Lightfoot because we've made his life a bit awkward as well. And as we reported last week, he's light footing it off the MHRA board, pardon the pun, uh, but he's standing down. And I just wonder perhaps when he was misinforming the board and accepting uh, a, a, an absolute lie from his uh, chief executive during a board meeting, um, I did bring this to his attention and said that the minutes should be rectified and I made his life a little bit awkward. It would be nice to think that I may have had something to do um, with him stepping down, but you know, who knows? Um, and finally, roll up, roll up, because it's MHRA board meeting time again. You're all very welcome. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. It's two and a half hours of lovies and self-congratulatory applauses on, on the back. But there you have it on the 18th of May. And uh, the agenda was there as well. So if you want to write a question according to the agenda, please do. I've got my ticket and I would love to be joined by as many of you as possible. So I look forward to that. Thank you very much for that really informative section. Apologies to our uh, listeners because there was a little bit of hot mic there. I was distracted because while we've been on air, uh, there's been a very small drone attack on the Kremlin. Uh, I picked that up initially on social media, but a few minutes ago it's gone up on the BBC. So I'll let people to look into that. But although it appears to be very, very small, of course, this could be an immensely significant act. Um, but I know you've got one uh, slide to finish the medical segment waiting, Alex, but just because I've interjected there with the Kremlin, this could be very, very dangerous for for everyone, really. I think uh, people have heard enough from both the mainstream talking heads and from the English speaking alternative media about why it's not a good idea to annoy the Russians. So I would like to give that soundbite over to Jobst because the Germans live rather closer to the Russians and the alternative media that he listens to in Germany and contributes to like Kontrafunk Radio uh, have a rather more sober assessment than we do of what happens if you poke a big stick at the Russian bear. Jobst, where do you think that could go if, the, if Moscow gets targeted? Well, you know, traditionally, it was never a good idea of West Europe to mingle with, with Russia. Uh, Russia is can't be, you know, vindicated. Uh, it is uh, it is too big. You can read it in Clausewitz already. We have to arrange uh, ourselves with Russia and we have to trade with Russia. You know, that's what we have always done and what is good for Europe. And we shouldn't be at war with Russia. Well, my final segment, which I know we'll have to do quickly, is on legal and democratic matters. Uh, first of all, uh, a viewer pointing out uh, something about the German health minister and holding his democratic 
uh, representative to account on the matter. This is a Scottish viewer has, who has written to several members of the Scottish Parliament on the back of Karl Lauterbach's disclosures, which will address Jobst, who, as you know, uh, um, viewers will know, uh, admitted all of these six points that are on this in the next slide, that, that the vaccine injuries are real, research is required, government agencies have failed, compensation programmes like the uh, vaccine damage payments in Britain are a mess, which is why Lauterbach felt compelled to say, I can understand the complaints. We are slowly gaining a clearer understanding of the situation, meaning Lauterbach was grudgingly admitted that there were far more vaccine-harmed people than ever publicly admitted, and that Lauterbach most incriminatingly perhaps said, I've always been aware of the one in 10,000 figure, and some people might say that's not that much. In view of all that, the Scottish viewer says to his own representatives, uh, how do you plan to inform the Scottish public of these risks that one in 10,000 suffer from severe effects, including death from the COVID jabs? I really hope you all take your oath very seriously and deny the World Economic Forum powers to govern us. But moving swiftly on, uh, this one is also about health and accountability. <coughs> Alex, Brian, Alex, to comment. Alex, if I can uh, just interject, um, we're taking a decision. We'll let the news run till half uh, till half past, which will give you some more time to finish a very important uh, segment. Uh, we'd like to do that. And uh, we'll also say to our members, there will not be an extra time, but we're taking that decision live because we think the segment is important. Very kind of you, Brian, because York has to get back to Cologne and I have to go off shortly after half past to tell the Dutch conservative Christian newspaper Reformatorisch Dagblad why not everyone supports King Charles, which they'll be surprised to hear from someone of my background. But there you go. Um, accountability again. Um, I was put onto this by a very stalwart viewer. And this is a 20 year background of collusion between Big Pharma and the British government, which, uh, again, as we have a few more minutes, you may be interested in commenting on from a German angle. The first meeting of the Ministerial Industry Strategy Group, I'd never heard of it, I don't know whether Brian or Debbie ever have, was held in November 2001, a high-level group bringing together government and pharmaceutical industry representatives. Viewers will be quick to notice this is the official government blurb, this isn't a conspiratorial write-up. It, it was brought together in that year, 2001, as part of the follow-up to the, recommend, the implementation of some recommendations called Pharmaceutical Industry Competitiveness Task Force. Notice what was the impetus here. Make Big Pharma more competitive. Make Britain PLC more competitive. Um, some detail, detail I will skip, but it's met twice a year for 22 years. It discusses strategic issues between ministers and Big Pharma. It particularly considers overall progress and action agreed in the Competitiveness Task Force of the pharmaceutical industry and it talks about competitiveness indicators, and it sets the direction of activity. For Big Pharma is setting policy, is how I read that, with government ministers and has done through Labour and Conservative and coalition governments for a generation. The group was originally co-chaired by the uh, health minister, not the health secretary, but his underling, and Tom McKillop, CEO of AstraZeneca, Britain's own Big Pharma big hitter. The Ministerial Industry Strategy Group was set up uh, oh, there's, a, there's a repetition there, sorry. Uh, the second part of the blurb says uh, that the co-chairs as of now are Andrew Lansley, now the Secretary of State for Health. So the government uh, side of it has been upped from the deputy to the, the overall principal Secretary of State for Health. And the current uh, industry side co-chair is still the CEO of AstraZeneca. That's now David Brennan. Who's in it? For the government, some of Debbie's well-known names, Lord Howe, Vince Cable, Lord Sassoon, David Willits for Secret First uh, Universities and Science, from Industry, uh, ABPI, um, Director General, uh, Modern, Modern Bioscientist PLC, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, Roche, uh, ASI Japanese, um, Worldwide Pharmaceutical Operations uh, Chief for Pfizer, and another GSK man. Uh, also, Officials from the Department of Health, the Treasury, the Department for Business and Innovation and Skills, uh, the, the Medicines and Healthcare uh, Reg Regulatory Products Agency, our old friend, the MHRA, and Trade and Investment also attend for the government. The MHRA sits on this body and has done 
well, since its inception and before that, uh, since the, body, the group was set up in 2001. Ministers and officials from other government departments, possibly intelligence, who knows, and other representatives from industry attend as and when necessary. The MS, MISG's long-term strategy, agreed in 2004, is to develop a long-term strategy for medicines needs. Medicines needs, not medical or medicinal needs, but medicines needs, that's needs for drugs to be designed so, so as to secure the provision of safe and effective medicines for patients, to maintain and strengthen the UK pharmaceuticals industry within Europe. Aha, Yobes, it's for us to outcompete you, it seems, and to advance healthcare innovation with the NHS. I'm a bit shocked by that, actually, Yobes. Did you know about any of this? I didn't know this particular one, but there has been a very long-standing private-public partnership to promote the interests of the pharmaceutical industry since its innovative power has declined which has been going on since 35 years. So they, they you know, they, they're running out of new, uh, really health-improving drugs, and so they have to do this. Yeah. Right. Participatory democracy. So happens to be another one of your pet subjects, Jobst. And uh, Charles Moore, a well-known long-term writer with the Daily Telegraph, wrote this at the end of March in the comment section. Why do the National Trust, which is Britain's premier uh, natural heritage preservation body, at least for England it has that name, the World Wildlife Fund, known worldwide, set up by the late Prince Philip, and the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, Note, we only have a national society for the prevention of cruelty to children, but birds and animals get a royal society. Why do these th three think they can redefine what's meant by the people? This will get your interest and the viewer's interest. Charles Moore writes this. Uh, listening to Radio 4, I heard the presenter say, citizens around the UK have come up with a people's plan to restore nature. Charles Moore found that there was a people's plan for nature online. It came out of a national conversation which produced a people's assembly created for the people by the people of the UK. This is not grassroots, however. Charles Moore goes on that there was 103 people in the coterie, not elected by any actual people. Rather, they were a representative group, self-proclaimed as such, randomly chosen, though with fewer whites than proportionally, and drawn from respondents to 33,000 letters of invitation. Take-up was fewer than 1%, even though each of the 103 who did attend got 800 quid for their pains and expenses. These happy few then listened at conferences to, and here's the, if Mike was with us today, he would say this is where the, the game is played, selecting the evidence, the, the experts who get to present the evidence and, and claim it's all the evidence there is. They listened to a wide range of evidence, carefully handpicked, of course, and case studies over four weekends advised by 40 experts. They were guided by, here's the Delphi technique, experienced facilitators who operated a rapid democracy progress. No time for democracy. Let's have the, the quick version. They came up with their, not the, but their people's plan for action. The facilitators are said to have themed and organized 26 calls for action. These, the website asserts in Soviet tone, as Charles Moore correctly says, demonstrate an irrefutable independent case for action grounded in the will of the people arising from. This isn't loose language. By the 70s, the Soviets were actually specifically saying we have more democracy than the West, not less, because we have these kinds of local sped up democracy processes on the work floor as well. Moore goes on that the calls for action include a new regulatory body, which would include a which would achieve a greater government accountability. Uh, uh, through a permanent assembly for nature. So you've got a commissioner for future generations, you've got a commissioner for children, commissioner for animals, you've also got the permanent assembly of nature now, made up of NGOs, industries, and that pesky little thing called the public. And also a, quote, union of influential organisations to establish a mandate for the proportionate inclusion of impact on nature in decision-making at all levels. Uh, I'll skip the detail that Charles Moore describes, but there are cartoonish ideas of nature having a seat at the table. Uh, seven-year-old level stuff, an eco-version of the Hippocratic Oath, which I think you swore, Joe Yobbs, when you were a doctor, would make government and businesses commit to do no more harm to nature. This is almost Georgia Guidestone stuff, isn't it? Leave room for nature, leave room for nature. Uh, pretty appalling stuff, but there you are. Participatory de democracy and uh, the final um, description by Charles Moore is, all these big charities, the RSBB, the WWF and the National Trust, which are very woke, all three, they in endorse the 26 people's calls for action because the People's Assembly was convened with their help and money. The amount of money is too big to ignore. Um, Moore says you've heard of these big three names. You might subscribe to them. I would personally advise you don't anymore, but that's just me, Alex Thompson speaking. But have you heard of the Sortition Foundation involved 89 up? 
and the new citizenship project. Nor had I. Well, Mike's Robinson certainly has. This is the idea of aleatory democracy, literally rolling the dice democracy. But this presentational brilliance, he says, has brought us the new definition of the people. That's what it's all about. The Sortition Foundation is an international movement. It believes that random selection is better than the ballot box. Uh, it's um, uh, one of the organizations here is a media agency that says we help the good guys achieve great things. The new citizenship project invented rapid democracy. If only we had that sort of democracy in 2015, according to its uh, advocates, how different Brexit uh, referendum outcome would have been. Uh, pretty good stuff. Yogs, you've got half a minute in this final segment just to comment on this before we go on to juries. Um, do you see this happening in Germany too? Well, this is a new trend that has been ongoing for a while now in the West. I call it pseudo-participation. So it's not the classical participation, which works in a totally different way via parliament, but also by associations, which form spontaneously and organize and aggregate, and then, you know, work at, at a high level, cooperation level to, to obtain compromises about society. This is a classical way of participation, as it was, you know, envisaged since the 17th century in England. But this is a new type of pseudo-participation, which is not participatory at all. If that's true, then juries in courts are old hat. And so the Ministry of Justice, which we didn't even have till 2007, um, has been putting out another bad explainer on what jury duty is, because in Britain and some other Commonwealth countries, you can get a letter through the post, which you wouldn't in Germany, saying uh, you're called up for jury duty. This was spotted by a Welsh viewer of ours. Uh, who then wrote, as we will see the, the scrolling of this email, to Bob Neill, the chairman of the Parliamentary Select Committee for Justice, saying she was concerned to see a parliamentary website mirroring this content uh, because it doesn't say what a jury can't do. Uh, can't, sorry, it does say what a jury can't do, but it never says what a jury can do. It doesn't tell them about their powers, only you must not. You must not be influenced by outside factors. The Welsh viewer correctly said no, a juror must positively vote on his count conscience, accounting all the evidence. Uh, classic examples like stealing because you're poor is different from stealing because you're greedy. And she also says our common law and our constitutional liberties, that's coronation oath again, allow the verdict to be reached even if only one juror is in conflict with the remaining 11 or in 14, the other uh, in Scotland, the other 14. Uh, that's about to change, you'll see in one minute's time. Put simply, 11 jurors, except in Scotland where it's 14, may oppose and nullify the verdict of one. Then the juries are told in the video, if you found the defendant guilty. So are juries told that it is they that held the power of sentencing, not the judge? She uh, finishes by saying, by what authority did the government suspend jury trials in England and Scotland in March 2020? Scotland, uh, England and Wales, sorry, and Scotland did similarly in its own right. The response was, uh, sorry, this is nothing to do with Parliament because it was just Ministry of Justice content. Uh, but she's uh, she's on the right track there. So Bob Neill needs some more polite letters on that regard. in that regard, I would say. Um, a retired Scottish judge uh, has been writing in Scottish legal news about the re re removal of jury trials for alleged rape. This is Roderick MacDonald, Lord Uist, uh, who says that the, the provisions of the Scottish Government bill are constitutionally repugnant. Uh, we will just uh, skip through some of the highlights. This is his conclusion of the matter, just to show people in context what it is that's constitutionally repugnant and which will be struck down by Strasbourg. Uh, in the end, he says, as being incompatible with Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights and therefore out with the competence of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, but the, the detail is, I'll just give a couple of sections. Uh, for this, the, what's on screen at the moment is judges can be removed from the case, contrary to all European practice, which Britain established at Strasbourg. We actually, you know, the reason we're in this framework is because we wanted the Continentals to catch up with us. We told the Continentals, you no more silly stuff like removing judges from trials. Now we're doing it in Britain, at least in Scotland. The other part, which uh, annoys Lord Uist very much, is that a single judge can hear a rape trial. This is a pilot project, okay? Um, this is contrary to ECHR for reasons he sets out. The Scottish ministers have got to um, review the operation of these trials, etc., and he's not having it. In other words, the work of these pilot courts is to be subject to review by the executive, and a review is to be made by Parliament. This is politicians treating the courts as forensic laboratories in which to experiment with policies, such as how can we get more men locked up for allegations of rape. OK, so the Times has already reported that lawyers have been threatening to boycott these uh, judgeless, juryless trials. Thomas Ross, a King's counsel, says that he notices a lot of people are saying no to it. And uh, 
Uh, Scotland currently has 15 anonymous jurors, soon to be 12, we'll see in a moment, but judges sitting alone will be under huge pressure to convict for political experimental reasons. So there's a bit of a pushback, even though David Scott, if he was here, would say Scottish ju- uh, legal profession is quite weak on this matter. Um, the Times goes on to say that also this bill is reducing Scotland's unusual, if not unique, 15-man jury to 12 and allowing a two-thirds majority. Both points have just been uh, uh, addressed by that Welsh viewer's letter as being safeguards. You've got to have unanimity among 12 or in Scotland even 15. Now it's 12 even in Scotland if this bill goes through and a two-thirds majority will do. So four out of 12 saying, I'm not sure it was, it was guilty, that will just go be ignored. Uh, the Daily Mail has also uh, said that not proven will be a new ver- uh, will be taken out of the Scottish uh, model. So you will not be able to choose as a ju- Scottish juror between guilty, not guilty, and case not proven, but only two. Why? It's very nakedly political because in the Daily Mail write up we see that groups such as Rape Crisis Scotland, third paragraph from bottom, say that if that was ditched, people would say, "Oh, I don't know. Then he's guilty." It's as naked as that. You know, a, a safeguard uh, to allow people to say there wasn't enough evidence is being removed for political reasons. This at a time when, as you know, real guilty um, rapists are being told you're getting off, pardon the pun, scot-free because you're under 25 and it's your first rape, as we recently saw with David. So there could be witch hunts against judges. Um, Ireland, very quickly in our final minute, is doing something equally bad, which is criminalising the possession of naughty material with a burden of proof on the owner to prove that the material was not hate material. The full title of the bill is on screen. Uh, Here is Free Speech Ireland noting that uh, an amendment to make it compatible with free speech protections was defeated in the Doyle. Elon Musk uh, responding to uh, an Irish tweeter talking about this. Uh, Keith Woods says it's a massive attack against freedom of speech. And there's the highlighted sections, which says in the first highlighted section, if you've got the material, you're going to prison, you know, at the wrong book. And the second highlight says a reverse burden of proof. If you've got the material, you're guilty unless you can argue your way out of it in court. Total reversal, although, of course, jokes, we've had that in Germany, starting with administrative law, haven't we? Because officials now in Germany have been told that if they're accused by the government of being hate mongers, they have to prove their innocence, if I remember correctly. That happened recently. Yeah. So we'll just close with this. Uh, Paul from Deal in Kent says that I thought UK Column were absolute nutters prior to the spring of 2020. How wrong was I? UK Column, thank you for helping me remain sane. And gratifyingly, what he's found was Martin Evans, dear Martin, writing us way back in 2010 on One World Governance. We looked like tinfoil nutters back then, didn't we? But Paul, among many others, has seen that we're not. And to gratify the audience as we take our leave, I'll uh, show them this to to give them a bit of a, a titter. Um, apparently for 20 hryvnia, which is 40 pence uh, in, in sterling, uh, you can get this in, in Ukraine, which is a nominally uh, official Ukrainian driving license in the name of, in this case, the Ukraine, the, the mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, uh, and, uh, you know, just for a joke. But there is a version which has turned up in the Netherlands, which is for the same amount of money, less than half of a pound sterling. You can apparently get yourself a Boris Johnson Ukrainian driving license, uh, all very officially produced. And a drunken driver in uh, the Netherlands of Ukrainian nationality presented this to Dutch police last week with the correct birth date and the correct place of birth being New York. Slava Ukraini. Oh, Alex, what do we say? Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, really important stuff on what's happening with juries. It's clear that the law, as it should be, is being interfered with. And UK column will definitely do more on that. Thank you for the little bit of uplift at the end. And I'll say that we've also had a, a viewer who says I'm ditching my Telegraph subscription and I'm coming over to the UK column for the quality of reporting. So, um People are paying attention, which is really good. So I'm going to thank uh, Alex and uh, Dr. Yopes for joining us and uh, Debbie also. Uh, We've run on a little bit today, which I was very happy to do, but that means no extra time today. Uh, But I'd also like to add a lot happening around the UK column at the moment. Mike Robinson, very busy doing some important things today. And we have got some really good news coming up. I'm going to tell you today just a little part of the secret that the UK column will be moving and this will be a very good thing for everything we're doing. 
And we can only make that move due to the tremendous financial support that our viewers and audience have given us over the years. So thank you all very much indeed. Uh, we will tell more in an extra time. That will be announced well before. So if you're an existing uh, member of UK Column, uh, we will be giving you the secrets about what's coming, but it is all good news and it's all down to our audience. So thank you all, wherever you are in the world, very much. We'll leave it there. Bye-bye.